Alrighty, folks, we are going to get started with today's webinar. Welcome. Happy mid-August. I hope everyone is doing well. My name is Francesca Spann. I use she, her pronouns and here at Lewis and Clark College. I run new student orientation for our undergrad students. I'm joined today by four other uh, staff members here at Lewis and Clark College who all work with students in some way to support their health and wellness needs. Today's Student Health 101 webinar will be recorded and made available later online in case you need to reference this or aren't able to joining, join us for the entirety of today's webinar. I'd like to start off by introducing um, everyone here on our panel. I'm joined by Michelle Callahan, Director of Health Promotion and Wellness, Jess Kingsbury, the Nurse Practitioner in the Student Health Center, Robin Kyler, the director of the Student Counseling Center, and finally, Gabby Herman from Case Management. I'm gonna pass over to Michelle, who is going to start our webinar today. Awesome, thank you so much, friend. And hello, everyone who is joining us today or watching this recording at a later date. We're so excited to be talking about what our offices can offer um, to your students, and I'm just gonna get right into it. Next slide, please, Fran. So the first thing we wanted to do is to start off with kind of a high level overview of each of our offices. Throughout today's webinar, you will be hearing each of us talk a little bit more about what each of our offices does, but they are so sometimes closely linked um, and work so closely together that we thought that helping by creating this graphic, we could help folks start to see the delineations between either, each of our offices. We do a lot of collaborative work um, together, all supporting our students, but this is here um, to help kind of give us this high level overview. So next slide, Fran. So as Fran mentioned earlier, my name is Michelle Callahan, she, her pronouns. I'm the Director of Health Promotion and Wellness. The contact information for my office is right next to my name, italicized at the top of the slide. And our office location is in Fowler Suite 110. Our office is open from 8.30 to 4.30 for students and anyone who needs um, any assistance from us. For the Office of Health Promotion and Wellness, at its core, we provide resources, education, and prevention programs that typically concern college students, Lewis and Clark students, and that is kind of a wide variety of things that can affect our health and health behaviors. You see topics there on the slide include interpersonal violence, prevention and advocacy, sexual health, body image, nutrition, so on and so forth. And at the end of the day, what my office is trying to work on with students is promote healthy decision making, helping them develop their health literacy and skills de development so that when they eventually leave the college, um, they will have all the skills they need to uh, live the healthiest lifestyle for them. One of the things that I do want to highlight um, for some folks is unlike some of the colleagues that will be presenting later, um, I'm not a mental or physical health care provider. I can't diagnose or treat any problems. And so that's a role delineation that I really, I like to make very clear for folks um, because it is can get a little tricky sometimes. And so I We'll do my best to refer students who need that sort of support to our student health center or our student counseling center, um, as that is not my lane. Um, can you go to the next slide, Fran, please? So here are some of the programs that the Office of Health Promotion is already kind of working on. So like I mentioned earlier, a big uh, tenant of the work that I do in this office is around sexual violence prevention and response. That includes bystander intervention workshops, healthy relationship workshops, and other tabling events to help promote healthy relationships for students on our campus. I also oversee our confidential advocate program. What that is, is a legally protected um, kind of uh, role that folks here have on, after they've undergone a training that provides support to folks who have been impacted by violence. And the advocates are not there to provide any sort of therapy or um, to do any sort of aftercare for those who's experienced harm, but really help those who are survivors navigate system, provide them with options on how they, we can, they can be best supported during their time at college. Uh, 
Some of the other things my office does is we have our sexual health and consent workshops that all first year students will go through as a part of their new student orientation. Uh, another aspect of the work that I do is around substance use and substance use prevention. And so we have a one-on-one -on -one sort of uh, intervention with students called our SAFES program, that's substance use prevention and education services. And that is where students can um, come into the office and talk about how they might want to change their behaviors around substance use if they so choose. And then otherwise, we provide general wellness support for individuals um, and the campus as a whole. And so that is briefly what my office does. I am now going to pass it over to my friend, Jess. Thanks, Michelle. So my name is Jess Kingsbury. I'm a nurse practitioner and I also work in Fowler. That's where our student health center clinic is located. Lower Fowler, there's a separate entrance. It is a little tricky to find, uh, but when students need to access us, we can always help direct them. Um, our services are confidential and they're available to all students regardless of type of insurance. So all visits to see a provider, talk to them, have an exam are free. And that's something that's really wonderful we have to offer our students. If we do other things, which I'll get into later, then there are some charges that are associated with those services. So to run down our staff, we have two medical providers, two nurse practitioners, myself, and then Kathleen Walker. We have a registered nurse, we have a laboratory technologist and administrative assistant who helps at the front desk. Next slide. So we're open similar to um, health promotion, Monday through Friday, 8.30 till four. We do not have after hours medical coverage in the clinic at all. So there's no one on call There's uh, that's a medical provider, um, but we do have some services that we can recommend if people need help after hours. But those are our hours, kind of basic clinical hours. Um, and then medical services, we do function like a primary care clinic and somewhat like an urgent care clinic in that we see a lot of college students have acute problems and that's what we see them for with regards to their health. So we see people for illness, injuries. We also do routine medical exams like physical exams, exams for travel or sports. Um, we also have a lab on site so we can do blood draws and we can send labs out for um, processing through Quest. We have a few prescriptions in the clinic, really basic things like antibiotics, inhalers, some topical medications, um, and then for other things we send out to local pharmacies based on patient request. We do have a lot of vaccines. So one of the things that Lewis and Clark is known for is their study abroad programs. And so we do a lot of travel health visits as well as vaccinations to get people ready to travel internationally. So we do have in stock things like yellow fever vaccine, Japanese encephalitis, typhoid. Um, so we can administer, administer those on site, which is really nice and convenient. And then we do are able to continue what's called maintenance allergy injections. So if a student's on allergy injections and their, their maintenance dose, we can continue that, which is helpful, avoids trips off campus to an allergist office. And the process, just to plug that for a moment, um, if you have a student or you are a student that needs that, the best course of action would be to call and make an appointment. And then we have a protocol to get someone set up within our clinic. And then we also make referrals all the time off campus as well for to specialists, to get imaging, radiology, performed and also have therapy, things like physical therapy, occupational therapy. We can help coordinate all of those referrals. Next slide. So in the event that things happen after hours, which is common, um, we have some advice recommendations. So one of the services that Lewis and Clark contracts with is with the, what's called the Nurse Consultation Service, also known as Phone Med. And it's a company that is offsite, out of state, uh, but they do offer, offer medical advice. And so students, if it's after hours, so outside of that window that I talked about when we're open, students can't get a hold of us, they can call this phone number and speak with a registered nurse and get medical advice on what to do, whether it's how to handle something acutely to determine if they need to go and be evaluated off campus. And so it's a great service after hours, weekends, holidays. And then now a lot of insurance companies also offer the same thing through your insurance company. And so that's another line of, you know, help that students have access to. So we're just like to remind people there are multiple options, ways to get good professional advice that's not just searching on Google. Um, and then, of course, if you need in-person care, that we have a number of local urgent cares and ERs that are 
fairly close by. And there's a list available on our website that can help narrow that down. Um, some urgent cares even offer what's called like a virtual visit or a video visit. And that can be a good stepping stone if someone can't get off campus easily, but does feel like they need to be seen in some capacity and we're closed, they can, or we're booked out, let's say, they can make an appointment with one of those um, clinics and be able to get some medical care um, when needed. And then the last option is a service that we don't we don't pay for. It's not contracted, but it is something we endorse and talk about that's called Dispatch Health. They do what's called house calls. So they'll come to you. Um, so for in this case, it could be come to the student on campus in their dorm room and do a visit on site. And there there is some coverage limits there. So like not all insurance plans are will pay for this. And so that's something to check with first so you don't get a big bill on the back end, but that could be a nice option if, if again, transportation's an issue for getting off campus. Next slide. So quick little thing, we're kind of starting to talk about student health insurance a little bit, or just insurance in general. We have what's called like a school sponsored plan through Pacific Source. We've worked with them for many years and had great experience with them. Um, they really, they provide a very robust insurance policy and coverage for students that is good for the full calendar year um, and is billed twice a year. So it's billed at the beginning of the fall term and the beginning of the spring term. There is a waiver deadline. So some people come into school with insurance and they don't want to have this extra insurance or have an additional plan, they, the, there's a waiver deadline for that. So be mindful of that as it approaches. Um, I will say that we we work with Pacific Source closely. We don't bill any insurance. So that's one thing a lot of people don't realize is we do not bill insurance. So anything that does have charges, which I should have referenced up above, but um, things that have charges would be like lab labs, vaccines, medications, anything beyond a visit where we talk and I do an exam. Um, so there are charges which we talk about in advance before they actually happen. So people aren't surprised by a bill on their student account. But with Pacific Source, they will reimburse you 100% for whatever services happen in the health center. So that's a really great, that can be great cost savings ultimately if students come in frequently and accrue charges, they will get, you will be able to get paid back 100%. And if you have questions, there's the email address and there's also a web page that has a lot of information. All right, next slide. And then this is just kind of quick touch on information about privacy and confidentiality. So as with medical and counseling therapy practices, our records are confidential and private. We are protected under what's called FERPA, the Family Educational Rights and, and Privacy Act. And the records that we have are considered treatment records, which are different than educational records. And nonetheless, what happens when someone turns 18 is that that privacy and protection shifts from being that of um, open to the guardian to being open only to the individual, so the student themselves. And so that means that it, we we will not be disclosing information to anyone outside the student. So. Um, and there's there's some nuance to that. And um, the next person who will speak, Robin, might touch a little more on this. but. Um, we we keep records, they are very secure, we can release them with a signed written consent. So that's our, our biggest thing is we always need consent that's in the form of a signature, um, a release of information. And then we do retain those records for seven years, which is required by the state of Oregon. And now I will pass it off to Robin. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm Dr. Robin Kyler. I'm the director and chief psychologist at the Student Counseling Center at Lewis and Clark, and we're very excited for your students or you as a student to join us. Um, the Student Counseling Center offers confidential, personal, or mental health counseling psychotherapy. Um, we are staffed by licensed mental health professionals of various disciplines. And we also provide training to advanced graduate students in um, clinical psychology. And so those trainees have had experience providing therapy before, and they are being supervised by psychologists on our staff. Um, what we try to accomplish is to have an initial consultation. It's just about 30 minutes with students who are seeking some support. And they may be uh, feeling already clear and ready that they really wanna start therapy or counseling on a regular basis, 
or sometimes they just don't know. There's just something not working very well for them or causing them distress. And so we have this initial consultation. We evaluate their individual needs and current uh, concerns. And um, we always double check on whether we're concerned about any risk factors for them. And then we make care recommendations after that uh, consultation. And uh, I'll show you in a moment the many services that we have available both within the Student Counseling Center and other offices on campus, as well as in the community that we can refer students to or recommend them. As Jess was mentioning, confidentiality, um, we, we also, in the same way, fall under the FERPA treatment records and also the protections, as do the nurse practitioners, the protections of uh, the state requirements for our licenses. And so um, that is why we require a release from the student, uh, an exception being if there is a very critical um, concern for safety, um, then uh, then there could there are some exceptions where we have to and are 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 guided to by state law. We do need to contact family members or identified emergency contacts uh, for safety concerns. Um, we also, if someone comes in prior to age 18 for counseling in the state of Oregon, between 14 and 17 year olds can initiate therapy on their own. They do not need a parent's uh, um, consent to do to initiate counseling. They can proceed with counseling, and there's a point at which uh, the therapist is does need to uh, to work with the student to pull parents into uh, awareness that they're in counseling, and so we work toward that. Um, and it, and there are some um, specific guidelines in terms of safety or high risk behaviors if someone's between the ages of 14 and 17 that might prompt us to contact family or or guardians earlier than uh, than we might for someone who is 18 or older um and so so please rest assured that if there's ever a need for you to be aware of your students well-being at a, at a level that we're concerned for their uh, for their personal safety, uh, like we're worried about a high level of suicidal ideation or a high level of risk to others, that we would take action, um, that we are helping to get them connected with the best resources possible uh, to continue to increase our interventions with them. And in some cases, we'll contact family if it gets to that level where we can break confidentiality. We also provide consultation to families. Uh, to uh, faculty and staff, to other professionals on campus, um, and uh, and we do uh, welcome your questions if you have questions or have concerns about um, about how best to serve your student. Fran, let's go ahead and click to the next one. This is a, a little uh, graphic to show. We start with that initial consultation, and then we have just so many possibilities, and that's why we say we sort of individualize a care plan for your student. Um, you'll notice some of them say SCC, that's the Student Counseling Center. We provide individual therapy, relationship therapy, group therapy. We do single session consultations with someone who really needs specialized services and is having some difficulty getting off campus, we can pro provide a therapy bridge and directly support that those referrals and that connection with someone who has a more specialized um, service off campus. Uh, we also have a psychiatrist who provides psychiatric uh, evaluation and medication management for students who are engaged in therapy in the counseling center. On campus, we also have campus-based peer support. We have various uh, various peer support, but as an example, we have a group called the Pio Support Network, and that it are those are trained and supervised undergraduate students who provide um, just a supportive community to have regular meetings to talk around themes that are important to the students, and then they also have some social connecting opportunities, and they're just really an excellent resource for those students who are just having trouble getting connected or really want to find some other people 
who have some similar identities or, or similar stressors as them. Um, we also have many amazing on-campus support referrals. My colleagues here are some of those, and uh, and we have more, and so we can get people connected, students connected with the supportive uh, resources on campus that may be beneficial to them. And then we do help with off-campus referrals for students who may need a more specialized care or who are seeking um, services uh, more than we are able to offer because we need to keep our doors open for as many students as we can. Uh, we also down at the bottom, it says outreach and consulting. Those are things that we offer um, just to the general community. And uh, next slide, please. I do want to speak briefly about crisis and urgent support. We do have um, daily weekdays uh, every afternoon for um, for a couple of hours, we have same day and next day urgent walk-in um, appointment. There, it says appointments, but they're walk-in uh, hours available. Students can come in. We have uh, their licensed therapists available um, to have a consultation to help uh, to intervene um, with a crisis or with an urgent need. Um, if we can't get them in that same day, we can get them scheduled for the next day. Um, and uh, so those are available for students daily. We also have an organization called the, or a group called the Welfare Intervention Network. And that is a group of, a uh, multidisciplinary group of um, professionals across campus who do a lot of direct student service. And that is a group that tries to connect the dots. If we hear about a student who's struggling in their classes and they're struggling in their living environment and they're sharing with their, perhaps maybe their work supervisor that they're feeling pretty discouraged or maybe are, um, are not, are really struggling with their mental health or their physical health or their academic health. Um, this is a group that meets regularly and and decides together what are some of the best ways we could intervene with that student to make sure they know about their support network on campus to ensure that we're um, we're aware uh, and giving an opportunity to assess for safety if those are concerns that we have um, and to get them connected. After hours, we also have services available to the students 24-7. Um, so we do have our campus safety officers who are who are well trained to respond to medical or mental health crises, as well as more simple things like um, being locked out of your, I think they help locked, like if your car is locked, sometimes they can help you sort out how to how to get some services, things like that. Um, and we have a 24-hour crisis counseling service that um, we encourage students to use. Our, we also have many other services available for crisis counseling and, and text support. This particular one um, is, is contracted with us, so we, uh, they can call me, actually, um, if they're needing a more urgent um, support for a student on campus um, or uh, to consult about our resources. And, uh, and we help the um, students to know about these services so that they also are aware when we're closed, there are on-campus supports immediately available 24 hours a day. I think that's all of my slides. I uh, no, that's not um, <laughs> one more. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so I mentioned earlier for students who are seeking very specialized therapies, um, they're wanting to engage in some psychoeducational or neuropsychological testing, for instance, to determine maybe they have interference as a result of a learning disability or ADHD or um, they're wondering if they might have, uh, they, they might be on the autism spectrum, for instance, or there's some other neuropsychological interference. We don't provide that on campus, but we can help, um, help the campus services can help them get connected for those, for those levels of care that we aren't able to provide. Um, also, if a student is seeking psychiatric medication only, and they're not wanting to combine that with psychotherapy, 
um, we're going to encourage them to find those services off campus. So we really do encourage if you, you are a student or you have a student coming who uh, you know ahead of time is going to need some of these services, um, we encourage you to contact your insurance company for current providers in, in proximity to Lewis and Clark. Uh, start those conversations early and now because sometimes there can be a little bit of a wait. Um, and Gabby Herman, our case manager, is going to talk a little bit now about referral and access help for students who may need an additional uh, students and families that may be needing some additional support in finding those off-campus resources. Thank you and welcome to Lewis and Clark. Hello everyone, I'm Gabby Herman. I'm the case manager here on campus. Um, I am based out of our Office of Student Accessibility, um, which does a lot of accommodations um, for our students who are navigating uh, the college experience with a disability. Um, something that I, a lot of things that I'm able to do um, are to support students in accessing wellness services, primarily off campus. Um, like Robin said, that would be psychiatry only. If a student comes in knowing they would like weekly therapy with a provider they'd like to see, you know, potentially all four years, um, I'm a good place to, to come and help students find providers. I'm also able to support students in making those connections. So I don't make any appointments for them, right? They're all adults, they're learning, they're growing, um, developing their independence uh, and their, their life skills. And I'm able to support them through that process, um, developing self-advocacy, -ad uh, building confidence in their ability to navigate wellness services um, and navigate college as an adult. Um, students come to me by self-referral, they'll come to my office seeking an appointment. They might be referred by another staff member um, on campus, potentially maybe like their area director and their dorm. Um, faculty have referred students to my office um, and also uh, get students referred from our welfare intervention network. Um, and that's usually in like a problem solving capacity. Um, what barriers are you experiencing? How can we help you overcome? Um, I am not a clinician. I don't provide therapy. Um, and as such, I don't have that level of confidentiality. So my office, I will speak to other folks on campus, area directors, other staff members that interface with students. I am able to share information. However, I still am under FERPA, so I'm not able to speak to parents uh, or other guardians about a student's particular Case unless that student uh, has chosen to sign a release. I'm happy to speak with parents and other guardians um, in generalities. I can also help you find resources um, that your student might be seeking. Um, so maybe keep keep that in mind. I'm not confidential on campus, but I'm still confidential um, you know, for your student. And yeah, a lot of, you know, what I do is just support students in building those skills and in growing uh, as an adult. Uh, next slide, please, Fran. So some common reasons uh, I've seen students, students looking for that long-term weekly therapy, psychiatry only, dental care, optometry, um, happy to help students figure that out, referrals for assessments, as Robin uh, said earlier, accessing basic needs. So sometimes students do come in um, maybe needing to, to go on public benefits or meet other basic needs, and then growing those self-advocacy and those life skills. Um, some students know they, they need something, they're struggling with something, but they're not quite sure what or how to go about um, solving those barriers or those, those problems. I'm a good place to be, and I can direct students uh, as needed uh, to various places on campus as well, and then primarily off-campus access. Thank you, Gabby, Jess, Robin, and Michelle. I do see that we have a lot of time left with our session, so we'll open up to any questions that folks might have. 
Um, someone did ask a question during the Q&A, so I will read that to the group. Um, but if anyone in attendance right now has any questions, feel free to drop them into our Q&A box. This question is from a parent and they want to confirm whether consent forms for students who are over 18 covers the same parent access as POAs. I think this might be a great question for Robin. Um, yeah, so a power of attorney, it's POA, um, is um, something I think a lot of parents are now being encouraged on a lot of most social media sites to look into. Um, and one of the things that we would like to suggest that you consider is that while it's very difficult, I have two college students of my own, um, while it's very difficult, that um, that one of the really important things that students are beginning to navigate is how to uh, begin to have their, uh, to develop their independence as an adult. And the consents that we mentioned, the uh, um, the uh, authorization to disclose or release of information to disclose protected health information are standard for your students so that as they are 18, this is gonna happen with every medical provider that they, that they meet with. Uh, sometimes I know for my own kids, it's frustrating for them because they would like my support and help and they can certainly give consents for me to assist them. Um, and also they're learning, uh, as, as um, Gabby was mentioning, it's, it's kind of been helpful. It was earlier than I was ready for it, but it has been helpful for me to be able to help guide them through how do I make an appointment? How do I advocate for myself? Um, my 20 year old recently had a mistaken charge um, to her insurance and, um, and we helped her figure out how to navigate challenging that charge on her account, which actually ended up being very, very helpful and empowering for her. And it was a little stressful for me because I wanted it to happen faster than she got to it, but, uh, but she did, she did get there. So what I want to say is that, yes, you can get a power of attorney, even with the power of attorney, we're still going to be seeking your student's consent and authorization to release mental health and medical records because those are at a really high level of sensitivity and there's a high levels of protection in the state of Oregon over those records. Um, and, um, and so the, the times when I think student, uh, that parents are concerned is, oh my, will my student end up in the hospital and I won't know about it and won't be able to talk to anyone. If your student is at a level of um, um, impairment where they cannot advocate, for, they cannot speak for themselves to give the consent for, for the hospital to contact you, the college probably will have already contacted you um, and um, and the hospital will work with you. And so we do, uh, we, I do want to encourage you to kind of recognize we're still going to seek the release of information, even if you have a power of attorney, um, if your student is able to speak on their own behalf. Jess, is there anything you would want to add to that? I think it's pretty similar both. Yeah. Yeah, I would I would just echo what you said. So, yep. Wonderful. This question I think is meant for Jess. I have two questions here. People want to know about transferring prescriptions uh, either to campus or near campus and just generally getting those prescriptions filled here in Oregon. Yes. So transferring prescriptions, we there's no way to transfer them to the clinic on campus. We don't have that ability. We don't have like a technical pharmacy. We have a dispensing area. Um, so if you if you have yours at say a Rite Aid in your hometown, you can transfer it to a Rite Aid in Portland. So that would be the process would be from your home to now Portland. Um, I know that there are some delivery services that you can get prescriptions delivered to your your address on campus, your mailbox on campus. That would be one way to actually receive it on campus and not have to go off campus. 
And then what was the other question we were wondering? What is the best way to fill prescriptions? Yeah, so we have, there are a number of pharmacies close by. We don't have any that deliver to campus unless it's one of those prescription services that you facilitate. So it's something that we would facilitate to have delivery to campus. A lot of students use Fred Meyer as the closest pharmacy that is um, the, the, the Pio bus runs there uh, every day, multiple times a day. And so it's really easy to get that if you're living on campus without a car. That's probably the closest pharmacy. There also is a Safeway that's just a little further down the road. Those are probably the two best. And then there's, I think, a Rite Aid maybe in Lake Oswego, which is south of us, which also could be accessed fairly easily by public, I think public, or at least like a quick Uber. Um, and then... I'm going to add while you're looking at yeah. the other is that um, the new there's some changes in our public transportation coming up, but I just heard in a meeting the other day, in addition to the our pile shuttle going by Fred Meyer, um, there's going to be also a. I'm not sure if it's the pile or a bus that you could connect with at uh, with from the pile that goes to the Safeway, which is actually really helpful because it hasn't been very accessible for students um, by public transportation until. Now it will be in September. Yay, that's great. Um, see another question. Yeah, if we need a licensed psychiatrist to be able to adjust medications or prescribe in within the state, I would say Gabby would be a good place to start to maybe have like a resource list. Um, sometimes there are, there's also and Gabby might use this, there's Psychology Today, which is a website, and you can put plug in many specifics of your about your plan, and then also who you're looking for, gender of the provider, various things like that, um, to hone your, your search into a local geographic area, and including like what your insurance coverage is, or go directly to your plan, and sometimes they provide a list as well. Following up on that question, Gabby, would you be around right now for someone to reach out before the semester yes. to contact? I am in office. I am very available. Um, my contact information can be found um, on our Office of Student Accessibility webpage. Uh, so if you go to lclark.edu, you can type in the search bar student accessibility. It'll pop up. Um, I have appointment slots uh, and also available for email. If you just want a, a list, I can send you that. Um, if your student wants a more interactive process, um, feel free to, you know, they can book an appointment with me and we can chit chat and, and figure out uh, what they need and how we can help them get it. I see another question that's popped up here. It reads, my child needs a shot for eczema to be refrigerated. Is the best place to send the delivery from the pharmacy to the college mailing address? Perhaps Jess might be able to comment on things that need to be refrigerated. Yes, it's a little tricky and I don't know what the what the mailroom situation is right now to be honest. I don't know if they have refrigeration capacity. If anyone else knows that um, on the panel, please chime in. Um, my off the cuff, because I don't know about the status of the mailroom right now, if they could immediately see the, the key, what has happened, we've had some allergy um, serums delivered that needed to be refrigerated and weren't labeled that they needed to be refrigerated. And so they weren't refrigerated. And so if if what comes in the mail is not clearly labeled that it needs to be refrigerated, it won't. Um, so that's one thing to be mindful of. And then the other, my other thought would be in this situation, if it was possible to actually have it be delivered, like come through a, an off-campus pharmacy, that might be a better way to ensure that it is when it's received in bulk to the pharmacy, it's refrigerated and it stays refrigerated until the student would be able to pick it up, which I know is extra steps, but um, it's the because I don't know about the mailroom refrigeration status. So, and we don't store medications um, in the clinic so, for students. I'm not too sure. I know the mailroom is very accommodating. And I think if you went and the package coming in was more clearly labeled, they'd be able to work something out. I know they have some type of refrigeration, at least for their personal lunches. I'm not sure how that translates over to student packages being in that fridge. Um, but if you're trying to get a hold of mail service, I'm happy to drop their email address in the chat. 
And while I do that, I'll read out another question that we have. Someone asks if we provide gender affirming medical care for students at the health center, such as testosterone and syringes and needles. If not, what do you recommend for transgender students for health care? Yes, I'm glad someone asked that. I didn't specifically touch on that in my section. And we do offer gender affirming care to students. We can prescribe, we can um, send in a, a, like the medication and any supplies that are needed. Kathleen Walker, who's our other nurse practitioner, has a lot of experience with that specifically. And so she is more the point person um, within the health center. But we both do. We certainly, if people are stable on doses, that's super straightforward as far as like, yes, we continue um, and are happy to and want to make that accessible. And if somehow something changed, we would truly bend over backwards to make sure those people have the service that they need, the care that they need. Portland also has community resources and, and we're connected with those people as well. Um, OHSU has a gender affirming care program. PRISM has a gender affirming care program. And then other clinics do gender affirming care as well. So there are local options within the community, but even within the health center, we offer that as well. Wonderful. I believe that was the last question received. I'm going to wait one more minute to see if anyone has any other last minute questions on their mind. But I will uh, just remind folks in addition to this webinar being recorded and available for leader reference, all of these folks can be found on our website. And if you're ever um, struggling to figure out who to contact, you're always welcome to email nso at lclark.edu. And we're more than happy to connect you with the right resource on campus. Students will be hearing from all of these folks again during new student orientation programming. Um, and so there will be some other times where they'll be able to walk by the office and recognize where it is on campus, as well as hear a little bit more in depth about some of these resources and how students connect during their four years here. I see someone says that they're typing, so I am going to wait just another little bit for them to get their question out. Someone asks if their transgender student should request an appointment, and if so, how should they do that? Uh, they are stable on a certain dose of testosterone. Oh, you are muted. Oops. Um, yes, I would. I would just call that first week of class and. Uh, make an appointment. I'd recommend that we, that that student has coverage maybe for like a month if that's possible, just to make sure that, you know, we have all our ducks in a row before we, um, that way we can see them in a timely manner um, and get new prescriptions in if that's ne needed, but certainly we will continue can continue that. Um, we hit a few snags when we reach breaks, and so that's one thing that we try to work with students on. Um, but so if if we come up to a break, more like summer break, then that's when a student might transition back to getting care at home if that's possible. If for whatever reason that's not possible, then we work with them. And um, we the students that we have or who are transgender, we we work closely with them just to make sure that their that their medications are available. That's the last thing we want is for someone to run out of medication. So, um, so we work closely with those students. And yes, Kathleen would be a great person to schedule with. And usually, our appointment availability, generally speaking, is pretty open if you look out like a week at the very most. Um, so we have a lot of same day availability and a lot of same week availability. So that student should be able to get in really quickly and easily. Wonderful. I think to wrap us up, unless Robin there has were, something. There were a couple more questions that came in. Um, there was someone who asked about their student couldn't be on the call. I think that um, it, it's really important to recognize that this uh, same group with a slightly different focus. Um, it will be speaking with all of the incoming students during orientation, during new student orientation. And so they will get, if they watch this video, then they're going to also get pretty similar, but slightly different information um, during orientation. So they should be fine doing it in live. And there's also prizes for the students. Sorry, we don't have prizes for you all here today, but there will be prizes for the students. So motivation to attend. 
Uh, sorry, Fran, I also saw a comment about um, the outdated health plan lists. Um, yes, that unfortunately is an issue. And so that's why, you know, we encourage uh, students if they have any difficulty um, to come to my office or to work with whoever they might be seeing in the counseling uh, counseling center on finding on finding somebody. Wonderful. And there was one question, just maybe you can answer about um, if you didn't answer it offline. Um, now I don't see it, but it was asking about if, do you have, if, if a transgender student is on, I, I, now I'm not finding it, um, is taking a stable dose of testosterone, do they need to transfer that to the pharmacy or do y'all have it? We don't carry that. So that would be, that would be something we would, we would send a prescription out to a local pharmacy. The student would pick it up and then self-administer. And we also do help some students administer injectable medications, a variety of injectable medications. And so if that's something the student needs, if they've been getting help with that from another healthcare provider locally and at home, we can help with that or help with uh, transitioning that into an independent practice on campus if that's desired. Wonderful. All righty. Well, I think that brings us to the end of our questions. And like I mentioned, feel free to keep sending them over via email or save your questions, both for students and parents during orientation. All of these folks here today will be in front of parents during and family members and friends, of course, during parents and family preview, August 30th and 31st, and new student orientation, which is August 30th through September 2nd. We can't wait to see you on campus soon and take care.